वे हैज कम टू वे हैज कम टू Metal Gear 5, or V as you might read it, was effectively the end of the Metal Gear franchise. Arguably the end was the fourth installment and Phantom Pain was merely cleanup. One could also argue that the third game, Snake Eater, was the actual ending with Guns of the Patriots being a needless foray into complications. This line of thought should illustrate well the nature of the franchise as a whole. It has always been messy, brimming with details and minutia, and divisive in reception. So then it's somewhat fitting that the grand finale of the series was equally so. Critics praised it, fans endlessly ridiculed it. For some it ruined the backstory of the entire setting. For others the setting was already in ruins. As for me, well, I was never much of a fan of the Metal Gear Solid franchise, and that's what leads me to the topic of this video. The value I find in a flawed product. Potential partially realized that I feel goes unnoticed. Perhaps it's my distance from the series that allows me this perspective. Fans become needlessly entangled in plot threads, minor details, and vast multiple game spanning issues that I just don't care about. It's been a while, brother. When Phantom Pain is discussed, usually it's on terms of its failings to bridge decades of material, themes, and characters. And it did fail on those terms. Previously flamboyant cartoon personalities were now hollow and dry. Its main plot was equally uninspired. Even its ending was unfinished. However, the game on what little it allotted for itself had its own merits. This video will be about those flaws and merits, a brief overview of its failings, and then an appeal for what I feel was its best element. I will be covering spoilers from the franchise. Moving on. Now go. Let the legend come back to life. I wouldn't say Phantom Pain is my favorite Metal Gear game. That would go to Snake Eater, and that's probably not a contentious opinion to have. However, I probably spent the most time playing Phantom Pain. Most of that time was spent roaming around the countryside, trying to see how many soldiers I could knock out, throw into an open bed truck, and then fault them to the sky without them falling to their death. The answer to that question, by the way, I think is a maximum of 13. Is rain man. I also threw a lot of magazines at the soldiers' heads in slow motion to hear the noise it made. Amazing. Needless to say, most of the game value I found in Phantom Pain was in its ability to be entertaining, an open-world game where I could goof off. From what I gather, most Metal Gear fans were anticipating another cutscene-heavy. Force go romp into fake politics and ridiculous pseudo science driven conspiracies about nukes. That is after all how Metal Gear became famous. It was one of the first game series to try to have a serious story at all. In terms of the franchise's writing, post Death Stranding, I feel like it's less controversial to say I've never been impressed with most of Kojima's writing. He has rather obvious flaws in his priorities and needs to be reined in constantly. His character dialogue is extremely long-winded and repetitious while being flowery and ridiculous. He is Japanese if you somehow didn't know, and in Japanese, the language can have words that mean 2, 3, 4, 5 or more things depending on how they are spelled, what characters are used, what the history of those characters are and so on. Perhaps this is why he obsesses over puns that either make no sense to English speakers or are so obvious that they come across as being childish. The motivations and principal dynamic that drives most of his stories are also often based on emotional evocative imagery and the kind of nonsensical philosophy that's often used by anime and RPG villains. If you've ever said aloud the phrase, "What the hell is he rambling about?" during a cutscene, you probably understand. I have a dream. What? If you're a fan of the series, then I fully expect you to know all of this. Let's not be coy. The games are stupid. They're very stupid. But that's also why they're fun. 
Somewhere in the midst of trying to parse Kojima's rambling, insane dialogue about whatever Wikipedia hole he fell into that week, you get used to it. A dud! It's not too bad. In fact, in between the utter madness and literal magic employed in most of the games, I still think that Kojima can expertly craft scenes and characters. Part of why Snake Eater is so beloved is because its primary conflict is a personal one between two characters. It's easy to understand, compelling, has a lot of depth, and it's sympathetic. More than that, it's a beautiful story. The wackiness going on in the background only serves to widen the experience the player has. Like most good stories, it's about human experience, first and foremost. The political nonsense is somewhat grounded, and more importantly, merely serves as the backbone for a more important story. To capitalism! This is in contrast with the second and fourth games, which have their own story issues. Kojima is not necessarily a bad writer, but he's also a very inconsistent, easily distracted, and long-winded one. I don't need to go into the politics of his career and all of his game's development hurdles to illustrate this any further. In terms of the writing, Kojima has severe problems. But he also has merit. Phantom Pain shares those traits. The original marketing pitched a concept of the story of Big Boss in the 1980s, when he had his final fall that transformed him into a villain. Child soldiers, the murder of innocent people, the trivialization of lives for the sake of ambitions. Allegedly, this was going to be Metal Gear 5. All while starring crazy characters like Naked Snake himself, Ocelot, and Kazuhiro Miller. It would even star Eli, Liquid Snake. Would a young Jack somehow make an appearance? Maybe it would jump across time periods. Maybe the miraculous return of fan-favorite characters using nano-machines. Fan service! Fan service! Fan service! For the finale of an entire series like Metal Gear, this is what the diehards wanted. As I mentioned, it did not deliver. Before writing the script, I couldn't even remember much of anything about Skullface or what his backstory or ambitions even were. Most of the core story is a blur. The plot that Metal Gear fans had the highest expectations for were the parts that left no impact on me at all. I can't imagine the disappointment that true fans must have felt. The game's story had severe problems. But it also has merit. While I played the game for trucks and bonking noises, there are certain elements of Phantom Pain that always stuck with me. The virtues that I found in V. When I think of the greatest parts of Phantom Pain's story, I think of hamburgers. The quest to find the perfect cancer-inducing hamburger with the help of an aging Navajo biologist. I had our best and brightest working overtime, fine-tuning the greatest burger the world has ever known. I think of Huey. Arguably one of the best characters in all of Metal Gear. Not because he's likable, certainly, but because of his characterization. He's a relatively untalented scientist who steals other people's work. He's a murderer that killed the mother of his child because she wouldn't allow it to be used as a test subject. And even if I did, what right do you have? He's a betrayer who caused the destruction of Soldiers Without Borders, a large portion of Diamond Dogs, and endangered the planet just because he would financially profit by it. And in his mind, none of this is true. He's an underappreciated genius. Strangelove committed suicide. He never knew about the XOF attack. He wasn't responsible for the parasitic mutation. He's the only sane one here. He believes all of it, to the point that Truth Serum has no effect, because that's what he is. He's a coward and a hypocrite. A wolf pretending to be a dog who rightfully accuses the Diamond Dogs of having the exact same fault. He alone, as the worst of them, recognizes what they are while failing to recognize his own faults, until later in the series when he takes his own life. Absolutely fantastic character. Hate that piece of shit. And I think of V himself. I understand the negative reaction to the big reveal at the end of Phantom Pain. 
don't really care because I'm not that involved, but I understand. I love the idea of Venom. Beaten switching people off the premise of the game was an unwise move, but the story of the medic is the main reason I wanted to make this video. This character has severe problems stemming from its placement and use, but it also has great merit. Venom, or Ahab, or V, or the medic, if you don't know, is not Big Boss. Or you might argue he was the real Big Boss. The internal premise of the character is that he is the body double of Big Boss that you killed in the original Metal Gear on the Famicom. The external premise of the character is that he is the avatar of the player, a muted protagonist that has enough personality to navigate the plot, but so little as to allow the player to project onto the character entirely. As I mentioned, I think that idea is interesting, but one they shouldn't have used in the series finale. But I'm not interested in getting bogged down by that point. Too often the character is dumped into the politics of that point, and is not discussed at all. No, the part of the character that I'm interested in is what little we see of his real personality. To see that, we have to explore what we know about him, which is very little. He was a top lieutenant within the brass of Big Boss's original mili- Wait, what? Militaire Sans Frontiers. Is that how you say The Militaire Sans Frontiers. MSF, a top lieutenant in MSF. Along with Morpho, who was the helicopter pilot from Ground Zeroes, and Kazuhiro Miller, the Cypher Associate, who would eventually turn full Diamond Dogs Lieutenant. The Big Four of the MSF. The medic is described by Big Boss as the best man we had. Venom was born in 1932 in California. This puts him as 44 years old during Peace Walker, 45 in Ground Zeroes, and 54 years old when he woke up and took up being Big Boss's doppelganger. That's a stout man. Being born in 1932, he would have been 7 to 13 years old during the Second Great War, but potentially an enlistee during the Korean War at 18 to 21 years old. But we don't actually know. I'll also mention that his career may have also aligned with the Berry Plan of 1954. I have no evidence of this. It's simply something I think aligns with events and something that Kojima would probably consider. This was an era of changes for the medical field within the military. It's possible that he experienced war in Korea before taking up residency for a full-time vocation. If he's also an ex-soldier like everyone else in MSF, then he likely was in the medical corps, although even that's not assured. What we do know is that he is a highly skilled professional soldier on par with the Big Boss's elites, and he was a medic. Considering his position alongside Big Boss and his supposed willingness to go to any lengths for his cause, he must have also been a great believer, likely a sycophant. Big Boss, Cypher, Ocelot, and Kaz all had full confidence in his ability and his goals. In terms of making this man the centerpiece of the V Project, no one had any doubts. Venom, mechanically, is a projection fantasy for the player. However, in-universe, he's also a projection fantasy. You see, as I like to harp upon, villains and heroes are creations. We are the ones who create them. People are their actions, certainly, but we judge those actions. And sometimes we project our fears, our hopes, our desires for vengeance, or our ambitions onto those people. And from our understanding of others, we craft the images of demons and angels. Venom reflects this, of course. Famously, his horn of debris embedded in his brain grows as more blood stains his hands. At the end of the game, that's what he sees, himself, as a demon. More than that, however, he is a walking emulation of that fiction. Prior to realizing what he actually is, he has been programmed to emulate his own hero. He is trying to live up to his own projection fantasy of the man he idolizes. The game was pitched to be about becoming a villain, Big Boss and his fall, into becoming the monster we had to put down. The man who would renounce his entire life to the grave of the woman he wrongfully killed. His hero. But tabling vocal cord parasites and giant robots and clones. Phantom Pain is actually about loss, of course. Not only the physical loss of an arm or an eye, but the haunting presence of murdered comrades or the guilt of old mistakes. 
the nature of hero worship or the condemnation of enemies. Our ability to find pain where there is no substance. To project idealized traits onto the dead or to vilify those that most embody our own flaws. We are a phantom. We are a hero, a villain, whatever the times asked us to be. The entire franchise can be said to be about two men misinterpreting the will of their hero. The boss, who saw Earth from space, her own smallness, realized who she was, as well as the value of respecting the life around her. Zero and Naked Snake would go on to ruin countless lives in an effort to craft a world where soldiers would always be protected, where they could always be heroes or villains, all because of their own phantoms. Both projected what they wanted to see onto the boss. Zero because of his fantasies, and Snake because it's all he had ever known. Venom was fashioned to live out all of that. The ideals of a man he already worshipped. He was designed to emulate someone he didn't truly know. Someone who didn't truly know himself. People spend their entire lives figuring out who they are. Why they choose what they do. Why they fail how much metal they have in moments of crisis, and recovering from mistakes made due to not knowing those answers. How? How can you possibly emulate someone else? I think of Ray Kurzweil, real-life futurist, inventor, and Google language developer. Kurzweil has stated his desire to live long enough to develop the means to bring his dead father back to life. His father, a concert pianist, died a long time ago when Ray was 22 years old. Ray only has his memories, photos, and some notes to use as a basis. He wishes to do this in much the same way that the fictional Mammalpod AI was used to emulate the boss in Peace Walker. He wants to program an AI to try to be a man he barely knew. Yes, they were father and son. I don't doubt the conviction or love. But consider again how little we know ourselves. Consider further how little those around us know us intimately, to the point that they would be able to understand your every action and motivation. Consider how complex human behavior is, being a product of the interaction of chemicals, atoms, and so forth. Even the prospect of a futuristic technology like teleportation or Star Trek transporters is likely impossible, because when you disassemble someone, you're effectively killing them. Whatever you reassemble somewhere else with chemically identical materials would have to be identical down to the positions of protons when you destroyed them. Even then, some wouldn't consider it to be the same person. The idea of resurrecting someone by programming a cartoon imitation of your perception of them is as offensive to me as it is ridiculous. Brother, it's been too long. One day humans might achieve a translation into machine intelligence, but it will surely be done with systematic translation of your biology into technological components. A careful, as of now, alien process that would assuredly require you to be alive. Anything that Kurzweil could ever program would not be his father. It would be a fantasy of his father, and a new life imprisoned by the directive to emulate the guesstimation of a human soul. Hey. It's just a machine. Venom was brainwashed into being that emulation. The ridiculous emulation of a hero. Imagine the most heroic person you can think of, the person you most admire, living or dead. Now imagine being given their body and being made to emulate them perfectly, without error, without fail, without exhaustion, without limits. Reality and truth be damned, you are now chained to be the god of your own creation born of your every unbridled, ignorant expectation of an otherwise normal person. With the ignorant faith of believing you had your hero's limit. God, what should I do? How close to the pedestal that you raised could you jump? Of course you would fail. Everyone would. We fail to meet expectations for ourselves. How can others live up to the expectations we have of them, much less our heroes and villains? That's what Venom had to be, because that's who he believed he was, a living legend. More importantly, I think of the man still trapped behind the veil. Behind the burden of being Big Boss, there was still the original man. 
I'll give Kojima some credit. I think the decision to write him as a medic was intentional. Knowing this much gives us an additional detail. The burden of guilt that can only come to a man who has sworn to do no harm. You see, Venom Snake is playing the part of a perfect soldier. He'll kill when he needs to, when his hero would kill. He'll bring as much misery and trauma to the world as his perception of Big Boss's philosophy allows. All while being a trained medical officer, a man whose life is founded on the notion of preserving life, whether friend or foe. Someone who likely took the osteopathic oath as it was adopted in 1954. Conjoined with this notion is the last trauma of his real life, one from nine years prior. One he never had the chance to recover from, because he was never allowed to acknowledge or process it. This brings us to Paz. My work is done. What are you talking about? V for victory! Rocket! Peace! Pacifica Ocean, or Paz Ortega Andrade, was another projection character. Her name, of course, means peace. In typical Metal Gear fashion, in reality, she's a triple agent. A Cypher agent working for the Russians in order to use MSF. She was an orphan raised within Cypher, brainwashed to serve Zero's interests. She believed there was no such thing as peace, and that all people were ultimately resources for others to abuse and dispose of. Her fiction, in contrast, was that of an orphan who was studying the politics of peace. When she's taken in by MSF, that's what they see, and ultimately, what they want to see. For some reason, Miller really pled my case. That was helpful, but the man is still a fool. His men are no better. A consistent theme of both Diamond Dogs and its predecessor MSF was that the soldiers under their employ were living a lie. As Huey pointed out, they were wolves presenting themselves as dogs. But, but from the outside, you're just thugs, rebels, a militia, you terrorists, an unhinged threat to society. You're nothing but a, a bunch of psychopaths! Just look at that dog! No! You named him D-Dog, but it's obvious anyone could see that's a wolf! Because you're all a bunch of wild dogs! You wanted to believe he was too! To feel some connection! To fight your loneliness! You wanted something to cling to! To prove you deserve to be alive! You wanted to forget the death! your sins, so you'd cling on to dogs, or, or wolves, or even Big Boss. Big Boss's goal with these two organizations was to create a world where soldiers would always be of use, never abandoned. We are going to be fighting the biggest beast of all, the times. More than that, he wished to create a nation of soldiers who acted as the military assets of all nations. They would fight one another on behalf of whatever the times dictated. They would be the living deterrents that would supplant the need for nukes. As Big Boss would say, in the future they would be whatever the times wanted them to be. Even if that meant becoming terrorists or villains. Yet the soldiers of MSF were greatly concerned with finding peace. Both in the world and in their own lives. Despite existing as living weapons and offering their service as weapons, they were still human. We will be stronger than ever. For our peace. This relationship between Big Boss, his basic nature as a train killer, but the drive to eliminate the need for snakes is at the heart of Metal Gear's entire story. So this girl, the fiction of Paz, was a vessel for this desire. On this base filled with abandoned military veterans, she was the target for all their doting, affection, and misplaced need to protect the world around them. Come on, we even both have peace in our name, said Miller. And Zadarna, that old Ruski's name, has something to do with peace too, right? Hey, as long as we're having a day of peace, we ought to get an act together. The Three Peace Band. I thought he was joking. He then proceeded to share his idea without bothering to check with me. And now, I am slated to sing. This was quite the contrast with how Pacifica had been trained and raised. She had been taught to betray and manipulate friends believed that everyone around her was a potential weakness and target, and that the success of a mission was the only real source of value in her life. She was also raised to be a gun. 
We see on her diary tapes that she couldn't quite understand the life she was having with MSF. Any threat to the lie of herself had to be filtered with cynicism and contempt. Anything a normal person would recognize as a simple, authentic, human experience. Playing with her kitten, which she had sardonically named Nuke. The men gave me a little fish. I held it out in my palm and the kitten happily ate it up. What a pathetic, feeble creature. Luxuriating under the sun. The ocean breeze felt so nice on my sun-soaked body. Nuke came over. It is one of his favorite spots, and stretched out next to me. The camaraderie of a game of football. I picked up a loose ball deep on the opponent's side of the field. Even though he's Nicaraguan, Chico cheered me on, yelling, Go for it! Shoot! I launched the ball as hard as I could, only to have it blocked by the keeper. Disappointment only increased my determination. In the end, I didn't score a single goal, and Costa Rica gave up its lead. It was really close, though. We congratulated each other on a good match and sprawled out in the shade on the deck, exhausted. Marveling at the beauty of nature. I wondered what kind of fish live below the surface, and thought back to the deep sea dives I had to do as part of training. Those were difficult days. But I remember finding the multicolored fish gliding through the water incredibly soothing. Or the simple act of cooking. The home-cooked flavor we'd achieved was a big hit with the men of MSF. Not that we are trying to impress them or anything. Even I could manage a dish like that. Snake enjoyed it too. Let me make this absolutely clear. I have no interest in that man. Any simple pleasure she enjoyed, she wrote off as another fiction. If it was not a lie, then it was a weakness. If it was not a weakness, it was subterfuge. Although she convinced herself she had the upper hand in her mission to either manipulate or destroy MSF, the reality of living this fictional piece got to her. Even by her own admission, she wished her lie was real. If I could just come up with some way to stall Cypher, at least until our day of peace. <sighs> when did I start having thoughts like this? She was a 25-year-old woman, playing the part of a 16-year-old girl. Yet she had never known what it was like to just be a normal girl and have normal experiences. This small dose of reality was like a poison to her worldview. When this group of misfit soldiers from around the world organized an event to celebrate the idea of a world without conflict, she did everything in her power to sabotage her own mission, just so that she could experience this peace stay with the rest of them. Due to being potentially discovered by Chico in the process of the sabotage, and also due to pressure by Cypher to finish her mission, she would never see Peace Day, of course. In her mind, the peace she had experienced, the paths that the soldiers saw her as, all of it was a lie. It was one she wanted to live, but just as fictional as the character she had played. So when Big Boss tried to stop her, any appeal to her character had already failed because they had allowed themselves to be deceived. Many people with antisocial personality disorders think this way. They behave maliciously, and when they succeed, it's self-fulfilling evidence that their victims are proving that their nature is required and justified. Yet as the story implies, in a way, this was who she really was. No amount of brainwashing, no amount of training as a soldier could remove their humanity. Their life on MSF's mother base was genuine. The desire to be at peace was genuine. The 16-year-old girl who never existed, who was waiting for Peace Day to arrive to save her from herself, was also genuine. In Phantom Pain, we learned that, at some point, Pass's tapes had been found prior to Ground Zero's. The medic knew all of this information going into the mission because the tapes are recounted in some form in his subconscious memories of her. Paz was a projection character for those soldiers, for the medic. He saw her as that 16-year-old girl, even knowing who she really was. They all did, because they had to. Admitting peace was a lie would be tantamount to admitting that their own peace was a lie. While the mission to retrieve Paz was presented as a logistical one, as she was their one hard link to cipher, the subtext was that they were literally fighting to retrieve the illusion of peace, the hope that they were not mere wolves. 
A lot of players don't like Paz. Sometimes it's because Peace Walker pushed her too strongly. Sometimes it's because of some feeling that her story detracted from the plot. Sometimes players just didn't like her attitude. But her role was an important one, and in context of the story, it's important to remember that she was an abused child who had never experienced real human life. She was as much of a victim of Cypher as those abandoned soldiers were of their institutions. And maybe more importantly, despite being made to be a gun, she was still close enough to her childhood to turn away from that role. Moving from Peace Walker to Ground Zeroes, her role in that game is important but limited. At this point, she's the piece that Big Boss and Medic by Proxy have set out to save. Skullface, who narratively is an anonymous consequence of the unending wars they've all been waging, is the one to capture and torture Pacifica and Chico. The tapes in Ground Zeroes very graphically depict what methods of torture Skullface and XOF used. Needless to say, the point of those tapes is to paint an image of not only the kind of inhuman man Skullface is, but to also illustrate the urgency for Big Boss to rescue both captives. They failed Paz when she was an agent, mentally suffering under their very noses. They failed her when they allowed the attack to happen. They failed her when they couldn't recover her body after she was flung into the Atlantic. And they failed her as she was raped, tortured, and had her organs surgically removed to implant bombs into her body. Well, at this point, the real Pacifica Ocean was a 25-year-old woman. The point of her character is clear. As a plot device, she's coded to be corrupted and lost innocence, but also the potential for salvation, no matter what your wounds are. This is the mental state for much of MSF, but for the medic, it's much worse. As the best man Big Boss had, Medic embodies the hopes of the MSF. As his own man, he's their man on the field who's charged with saving their lives. I don't think it's assuming too much of a military-trained medical officer, who may have been through the Korean War as a kid himself, to say, while he had seen a lot of death, every component to his character is wired to save others from it. If he's really so excellent of a soldier, I also ascribe to him the values of excellence that should be found in those that serve to heal. I'll go alone. Boss, what are you... There's no need for that. We can't afford to lose anyone else. We have no idea what's going on exactly. in there. Exactly. Anyone still alive at their breaking point. I think that's fair. His only job on this mission is to save the lives of any survivors or Big Boss himself. Chico may technically be viewed as Big Boss's first child soldier, and Paz may be a fiction, but these are still treated as non-combatants, victims, children. To this medic, who is a 43-year-old man, I imagine this to be of great importance to his character. These are the kind of people soldiers enlist to protect, especially for a healer. This mission will either save them or break them. Now imagine the absolute failure that follows. His only purpose here is to help this girl. She must survive. Ever since she had been lost, she has been physically and mentally tortured to get information as the best way to get to zero. In fact, you're officially only there for the same reason. Skullface treated her as a soldier, a military objective, as Pacifica Ocean trained agents of Cypher. Professionally, you must as well. But she's more than that to you, to all the soldiers you're working with. You know what happened to her and what she is. You heard those tapes. You remember being a soldier at her age. You recognize the pain she's going through and the confusion in her life. She doesn't have to be a living gun, a wolf, like you are. You can save her, for not only her sake, but the sake of proving to yourself that you're all not just some cult of killers hiding away on an abandoned oil platform. Preserving her life, even the fictional one she was given, is like you're preserving the lie all of you have been living on that base. The peace you're after is not just a pretty lie. It's something you can fight for. It's something that only you can save. And you fail. The surgery has to be done quickly without a sterile environment and without anesthetic. It causes her far more suffering. When you learn about that second bomb, you can't do anything. It's your own patient who has the medal and courage to sacrifice what little life she has left to save you, her enemy. Ultimately, 
You did nothing but cause more harm. You failed to save peace. You failed your men back at base. You proved that you're just a washed up soldier abandoned by his country who was only ever born to bring suffering into the world. The, the Korean War, all the men you didn't save, the collateral damage you caused, the lives you've destroyed, the, the children you've killed. Those thoughts spray through your mind for just a moment as you throw yourself in front of the one man you mistakenly believe has all the answers. But you'll never know yourself because that's the man you wake up as. Unlike Big Boss, John, the actual man, not the hero, and unlike anyone that survived the XOF attack that followed, you never had the chance to process any of this. Instead, you lay in that coma for nine years. And when you wake up, you're programmed to be a man who wouldn't be affected by such things. You're not a medic. You're a legendary soldier, the man who killed the boss herself. A man who wouldn't hesitate or think such thoughts. You're a living legend and a hero to your men. And so that ability to cope and process never happens. The medic is trapped from that point on, in that moment of loss and failure, behind the mask of greatness and spectacle. It's your only chance. Let's go over the situation again. We've got another parasite outbreak in the laboratory on the quarantine platform. The healing process for Medic is something you can see happen in Phantom Pain, albeit slowly. He's confronted consistently by two main issues, his inability to save his own people and their true nature as wolves. The path for this character culminates in the Wolbachi outbreak on base. He's forced to go into the quarantine and murder his own soldiers. I don't need to paint an image for you of how distant this behavior must be from what the medic would actually do. In many ways, it's the same situation as what he went through in Ground Zeroes. He was unable to perform his service, ultimately causes more pain for those that are begging him for help, and fails to live up to the fiction they aspire to make real. And like before, he's unable to process it because he's a walking projection of a man that doesn't exist. The thread of this story, which to me was far more interesting than anything Skullface had to say, leads to a little room in the hospital wing. If you didn't know in Phantom Pain there is an optional sequence in which Paz survives. For a while this might fool the player, especially if they never played Ground Zeroes or Peace Walker. Supposedly the memories you had from that moment were confused from the attack and subsequent brain damage. In this version of events, you got both bombs. It's okay. The other bomb, we managed it. No! Has jumped from the helicopter in error, and the explosion was from an RPG and mid-air collision. Now a 31-year-old Paz is locked in place. A 16-year-old girl believing her own lie and reliving the same moment three days away from peace day, every day. You mean, yeah, she still thinks it's 1974. She's got no memory of anything before that either. Cypher, the KGB, nothing. It looks to be a kind of dissociative disorder. Dissociative amnesia, where memories are blocked out to protect the mind. And dissociative identity disorder, the whole personality changes. What we're seeing seems to be a combination of the two. She truly believes she's nothing more than a student living in 1974. Peace Day was a lot of fun. I hope we can do it again. All the photos you give her are memories that lead to uncomfortable truths. They always cause pain and make her retreat back into sleep. Somehow eventually you find that the second bomb you removed is still there. Of course you realize Pacific Ocean really did die nine years ago. This is the medic trying to heal one last time. This fantasy of him saving peace and her washing up to his doorstep to prove he had done all he could was the only way Venom Snake could recover. It was the only way medic could help himself while not breaking the character of himself. 
The truth of it is, those conversations with Ocelot, Miller, and Pez never happened. This entire time, Ahab has been a severely injured 54-year-old man, somberly walking around in an empty hospital room, pretending to speak to the last patient he never saved, and pretending that he really was a hero, not the villain he knew he had to be. Morpho butterflies have been used in Metal Gear to symbolize rebirth or healing. When the AI on board Peace Walker makes the decision to destroy itself, it's followed by a cloud of butterflies. Naked Snake in the third game forms one out of Eva's heart-shaped C4. Gotcha this time. Earlier, he had failed to catch one due to the fresh loss of an eye, his inability to perceive depth. When Venom finally accepts what really happened to Paz, he tries to catch an illusory Morpho butterfly, but like his supposed namesake, only pulls back an empty hand. It isn't until much later that Venom gets the full story of who he really is, even if the healing process had already begun. There, we get a full admittance to everything that had happened. Paz's second bomb went off as she threw herself from that helicopter. The medic had thrown himself in front of Big Boss. In many ways, that was the moment he had died. Now do you remember who you are, what you were meant to do? As Big Boss puts it, Venom isn't just Big Boss as well, it's the two of them. Both of them were necessary to create the image of this legendary hero all to manufacture a lie that they wanted to make real, all to try to change the future. The same mistake all of them have been repeating since their days on Mother Base. These are the things I find value in. The concept of Venom had a lot of merit. Paz had a lot of merit. Out of the three games that this one story came from, oddly, Ground Zeroes probably had the greatest fan reception, despite it just being a demo. As I've said, these games, the story, had severe problems, but it also has great merit. I really like the idea of this character, this concept. I've tried to paint the value of what I see in it. I hope I succeeded in that much, at least. In a more perfect world, maybe the isolated story of Paz, the Medic Ground Zeroes, and the Phantom Pain flashbacks would have been their own self-contained game, with a character-focused story about a long-forgotten body double who wasn't particularly important to the world he died for. And Middle Gear 5 would have just been Big Boss being evil and conscripting child soldiers and so on like everyone wanted. At the end of Phantom Pain, when Venom embraces being Big Boss's Phantom, we get a time lapse. No matter what morality you exhibited in the game, it's clear that Venom eventually becomes the blood-stained demon he had always fought. The camera plays it almost like a victory, something Kojima thought people would be excited about. Thinking of Venom the way that I do, however, it seems more like the realization broke him. At that moment when Big Boss smiles back at the mirror covered in blood, the medic truly died. Instead, the projection fantasy won, and from that point forward, the meme, as Kojima puts it, of the idea of Big Boss won out. A consistent lesson in Metal Gear is that genetics don't make the man. Liquid had the best genes. Ocelot brainwashed himself into being someone else entirely. The boss was resurrected as the idea of herself in a machine body, and the real legend of Big Boss was manufactured by an old Californian medical officer who had no relation to the original at all. Characters in this series consistently vilify themselves by trying to live out lofty ideals, rather than simply existing as human beings. Paz, the MSF, Venom, Big Boss, Zero Ocelot, Liquid Jack, all of them in some way were prisoners to the idea of who they thought they should be. So maybe I'm in error. While I see a lot in the character of the medic, most of that is projection and supposition. But then again, that's most of the value we find in fiction, isn't it? I hope you enjoyed mine. So long. Kept you waiting, huh?
Once again, thank you to Grey Mind for the spectacular work on this video. I was gladdened to hear that it was a favorite series of his, so that our interests could align so perfectly. Thank you, of course, to my patrons. All of you have been extraordinarily patient through a very troublesome year for all of us. I've had my own deteriorating health problems, anxiety, and so on, but I hope the content I've been able to produce has helped to ease some of your own troubles. My main goal with all my content, all my non-joke content anyways, is to encourage everyone to grow in a critical but positive way. I love hearing your own success stories. Please, if you feel compelled to make content, just make it. Don't waste your own potential fantasizing about success. Just do it. The broader your failings, the greater the scope for your own success. And when you succeed, you'll find other people who will be willing to help with your own failings. Nothing is perfect. So make something. Thank you again, Grey Mind, for helping me out with my own shortcomings. Be critical, be kind. So long.